Let's move. Um, and um, Aul? Aul. Aul. Aul will get out at the end, whenever he wants to. <coughs> um, so before we, um, Andrew will come out and say a few things. Thanks, John. Um, hello, everyone. So, let's see. Um, uh, by way of introduction, I'm Andrew, the Chief Scientist of Baidu. So, on behalf of Baidu, I wanted to welcome all of you to this event. Um, I'm really excited to see so many of you here. And one thing that I'm not sure you know is that um, because of space constraints, I think there were 125 of you that we were able to get in, and there were about 360 others on the wait list that unfortunately we could not um, let in. And I think that maybe speaks to the um, excitement uh, that we have here in Silicon Valley about machine learning. And so we're glad at Baidu to we'll support some of that excitement. Um, and because, you know, of all the people that signed up for this meetup, I guess what, something only a quarter got in, I hope that those of you that are in the room will, you know, feel encouraged to tweet or Facebook share or blog or whatever, uh, 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 whatever you see here today so that those that weren't able to make it in here can learn a bit about about what uh, about these machine learning things as well. Um, so let's see. In the time since uh, uh, John Baidu, you know, we've learned a few things about building machine learning systems. I want to share a little bit of that with you. Um, one thing I've learned uh, working in machine learning is that um, computer systems really matters, and the approach that uh, we've taken here um, in building machine learning. <coughs> building machine learning projects is by having a fantastic computer systems team build very sophisticated uh, <coughs> GPU or supercomputing infrastructure and to have a fantastic computer systems team partner with a fantastic machine learning team and it's really only by the support of the fantastic systems that lets us do um, that lets us make efficient progress in machine learning and to us at Baidu Machine learning progress is, is really a close partnership between great systems researchers and great machine learning researchers, where the machine learning researchers really empowered or able to make rapid progress in machine learning because of the large investment that we make in computer systems. And so I'm particularly excited about the presentation that you hear a little bit from Aoni because uh, what you hear about is really the, the, the first of the major fruits uh, that the AI lab here has developed using this approach to machine learning. And I guess um, you hear Ali talk about speech recognition, and uh, a second reason I'm excited about that is because I think speech recognition is one of those technologies that um, has been slowly getting better you know, for a long time, maybe for decades, and I feel like it's one of those technologies that is poised to transform the way all of us, the way all of you interact with computers. Um, just as one example, and I think Ali will talk about others, you know, the whole world is moving to mobile. Um, and no one has figured out a good user interface for mobile devices. Uh, you know, all of us spend time typing on these ridiculous tiny little keyboards. And I know that when I'm driving home, right, uh, uh, in the evenings, I would love to be able to send a text message to, to my wife by talking to my phone. But I don't even try because if my car is noisy and I just know it's not going to work. And so what um, Omni and team have been working on is advances in speech recognition that will make speech recognition work much better in quiet environments, but maybe especially in noisy environments, like when the cell phone is in your car in the passenger seat. And I hope that with advances in machine learning like this, that in the coming months, or maybe years, we'll be able to transform the way that all of us can interact with mobile devices um, and other applications besides. So with that, um, you know, I'm excited that so many of you are here, and I think uh, John is going to introduce Alan. But I'll help by the work of the group. Thank you. So, Alan will talk about speech recognition using deep learning. So, let's, let's do it. Thanks. Hey guys. So, actually, can you hear me okay without the microphone? Yeah. Okay. okay, good. I'm going to try not to use it. If you can't hear me in the back at any point, I'll start using the microphone, but for now. Uh, so I have with me Godel Escherbach from John, and uh, 
you know, I tried to read the first hundred pages of this book. It's pretty good. I never made it through the rest, but uh, uh, so I, th I think it's pretty good. Uh, I think what I'll do is I don't have any criteria for who gets this book, but you ask particularly good questions during this presentation and after, then you know, arbitrarily pick one of the question askers and give it to them. So I'm going to set it right here. Okay. Okay, so as Andrew said, I'm going to talk about uh, speech recognition and how we here have been using uh, deep learning to scale up and make progress in speech recognition. Uh, and as Andrew alluded to, uh, what we're really interested in doing here is solving speech recognition. And when I say solve speech recognition, uh, what I don't mean is that it works pretty well when you're holding your phone close to your mouth and you're speaking, say, slowly or clearly or loudly. But we want it to work in a wide array of contexts. So Andrew gave a great example of, say, when your phone is on your passenger seat and you're driving, and of course it's going to be noisy. But right now that doesn't work very well. Uh, another example might be, say, that you're watching TV and you're sitting relatively <laughs> far away from your TV. and the volume is on, so there's some noise. Perhaps uh, there are kids playing or other people talking in the living room. And you'd like to be able to interact with your TV with you know, voice as your interface. Uh, in order for that to work, uh, we need to make a lot of progress, in, uh, particularly in noisy speech recognition, low SNR speech recognition. So uh, that's the kind of examples that we're thinking of when, when I say we're trying to solve speech recognition. and uh, and Deep speech, which is what I'm going to talk about momentarily, is, uh, as Andrew was saying, some of the research, the research really, that we have uh, done recently in order to make progress on this. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, here's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, ultimately, like I said, I want to talk about deep speech. But in order such that everyone is on kind of the same page, so that you guys all have uh, enough context. First, I'll talk a bit about uh, what is the current state of speech recognition. Uh, where does it work? Where does it not work? Uh, why does it not work? And, uh, and actually, how does it work? I'll get into the details of how speech recognition cur currently works. Uh, after that, I'll talk a bit about deep learning. And I'm not really going to get too much into the details of uh, just uh, general deep learning, but uh, my goal there really is to leave you with some intuition for why it is a promising vector, a prom promising kind of route with which we can follow to make progress in speech recognition. Uh, and then finally, hopefully you guys will have enough context on those two kind of fields, uh, and I will get into deep speech and really discuss the, I'd say, two main ingredients for what has allowed us here at Baidu to make progress in uh, speech recognition using our deep speech system. Uh, and I'll, of course, talk about the model in a little bit of depth. Okay, so uh, let me just say, actually, uh, so the plan is to, I'm going I'm to try to keep this presentation relatively short, maybe half an hour, and the plan is to, after that, have a little time for questions, and I'd actually like to invite a couple of my colleagues up here with me to help answer s some of those questions. Um, so if you guys uh, do have questions that are kind of more generic or less relevant to the current thing I'm currently talking about, I'd ask that you kind of hold those to the end, and uh, and we'll have some time for that afterwards. Okay? Great. So, speech recognition. <coughs> All right. So, as I alluded to already, where where does where does it not work? Uh, one one example is is signal to noise. So one failure mode of speech recognition is when signal to noise ratio is low. And this can be brought about for several reasons. Perhaps the most straightforward to see is when there is a lot of background noise, uh, as in the, the, the car situation or the TV situation. Uh, but there are other reasons you can have low SNR. So one such reason might be what's called far field speech recognition. And what this is is when I'm trying to 
have a microphone which is in a distance from me recognize my speech. <coughs> and even if there isn't a lot of noise it, at this time, uh, it will still be hard because the signal will die out. Uh, another thing that can cause low SNR is what's called reverberation. So right now I'm kind of speaking, say there's a microphone in that, that phone right there. I'm speaking directly towards it, but of course not all of my speech is going straight to the microphone, right? Some of it is bouncing off the wall, some of it is bouncing off you guys, all the surfaces in this room. And it's eventually going to arrive, well, some of it will eventually arrive back at that microphone, but it will smear in time, and uh, that will create low SNR as well. So signal-to-noise ratio is one thing that we have to really make progress on. Uh, speech when the signal to noise ratio is low. Uh, another failure mode of speech recognition today is speaker variability. So a great example of this is our accents, right? If you have a very strong Scottish accent, for example, uh, probably you have noticed that most state-of-the-art speech recognizers will not work very well for you. Uh, you know, really any kind of strong accent that uh, the speech system is not used to seeing. Uh, the speaker variability can be brought about for other reasons other than accents. Uh, you know, gender, differences in gender, differences in age can cause speaker variability. Children are actually much harder than adults uh, to recognize their voice. And, you know, somewhat a function of the fact that they're missing in training sets, but they can be a lot harder. One other thing that varies even on a human to human basis is uh, the length of your vocal tract. So this can make the speech signal look quite different. Uh, to a machine, and this varies quite a bit even on a human-to-human -human basis. So speaker variability is another thing that we have to make progress on. The last thing is natural or conversational speech. So typically when you guys use speech recognition today, uh, you speak in a really affected manner. Uh, what that means is you, you might speak really slowly or you know loudly like you're scolding a small child or reading off of a sheet of paper into your phone. Uh, and and the, the converse of that is natural or conversational speech. This is how we speak all the time. This is kind of how I'm talking right now, or say if the two of us had a conversation and I wanted to transcribe that speech. This would be natural or conversational speech. And why is that so hard? Well, for a lot of reasons. Uh, as I'm talking, you might notice that sometimes I speak really quickly, sometimes I speak really slowly. Uh, this makes it hard for, uh, for a speech recognizer. Uh, other things are, are what, what are called disfluencies. So these are such things as me starting a word and not finishing it, or speaking over myself. Uh, uhs and ums, likes, filler words such as that. Okay. So, yes? So how much of the impact is there due to like computer not understanding language well, that's one. And second, by lack of like a non-verbal cues. So first question, how much of an impact is due to language? Oh, right. So the computer don't understand human language as well to begin with. So right. How much impact that has? And <coughs> second, like, uh, computers cannot see the lip, the movement, and like other non I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, so language, that's a harder one to give you a quantitative number. But uh, better language understanding usually does help speech recognizers, as you would expect. Uh, you know, there's a big gap, as you'll see, between uh, like clean speech and noisy speech, uh, in terms of recognizing that, and you know that's kind of using the same language modeling at its core. So there is still a lot of just understanding the raw speech signal involved. But you know, better language usually leads to better speech. Uh, in terms of your second question, let me uh, maybe I'll just answer it with uh, an observation, rather. And the observation is that if I uh, close my eyes and cover one of my ears, I can still transcribe speech much much better than machines. Uh, without any kind of visual cues from lip reading or such things as that. Uh, so it can help, but I don't think it's it's going to get us, you know, you know most of the way. <coughs> so you guys might have noticed uh, this proliferation of devices, uh, which at their core have speech recognition for their interfaces. I certainly have noticed this, and up here on your left, I guess we have. What the smart watches, which you can kind of you know, swipe side to side and up and down. But if you really want to interact with these things in a meaningful way, you have to speak to them. Uh, and you know, it would be cool to be able to walk while you're using your smart watch and compose a text message. But that's not quite a seamless <laughs> process. 
right here we have what's called the Baidu Eye. This is one of our products. And it, this thing is really cool. You wear it around the back of your head like so. And it's got uh, a camera above your right ear and uh, a speaker in your left ear. And uh, it can kind of perceive your field of vision. And in order to interact with this thing, you have to, of course, speak to it. And it will Bluetooth to your phone. So in order for that to be a seamless process, again, we need to make progress on at least the SNR and, the, the, and hopefully the natural speech. Uh, you guys are probably all familiar with the Amazon Echo, this one here. Uh, that's, it's a smart speaker. You can ask it to do such things as say, Echo, add milk to my shopping cart, or Echo, play some pop music. Uh, but anecdotally, at least I've heard, is that if you ask the Amazon Echo to play some pop music, uh, it will start playing music and create a little cloud of noise around itself. And uh, then it will be much harder to interact with it at, after that. <laughs> so again, for these these things to be seamless, we really need to make progress in the low SNR setting. The other thing that I think is really cool about the Amazon Echo actually is that it has, or at least really interesting, <laughs> is it has seven microphones. Uh, and the reason it has so many microphones is so that it can kind of zoom in on the source of sound. Uh, so if you want to speak to it from far away, it can kind of find where you are and zoom in, right? Uh, That's interesting, though, because, you know, we humans, we have two ears, right? Essentially two microphones. Uh, and yet we can transcribe speech, we can recognize speech much, much better than all of these devices currently can. So it suggests to me that there's something kind of algorithmic missing from the picture. Okay. So. How does speech recognition work today? <coughs> well, it all starts when I get a snippet of audio. I put it into my machine. It's a waveform. And I feed that into what's called an acoustic model. Can you guys read this in the back? It's difficult. Bummer. Not sure what to do here. You turn off the lights here in the front. Yeah, the yeah. ceiling lights are. The lights do, in the front okay. do interfere a little bit with the. Uh, I do not know how to do that. <laughs> no, it's, it's down there somewhere. Okay, well, I will describe what's on these pictures until. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Okay, all right, yeah, all right. I just noticed the juice in the background. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so, uh, like I said, we have an acoustic model, and that acoustic model receives the raw audio. And the job of the acoustic model is, given a snippet of audio, it has to make a prediction over what phoneme might be present in that audio. So a phoneme is a unit of sound, and it has to make a prediction over what units of sound might be present in that audio. The acoustic model then feeds those predictions into the phony model. The job of the phony model is to make a prediction over what words might be present given some prediction over phonemes. The phony model then feeds these kind of predictions over words into a language model. And the job of the language model is to say, assign higher probability to words that are likely to co-occur together and lower probability to words that are unlikely to co-occur together. So an example might be, say, that I said, the cat sat. And my acoustic model and my phony model kind of spit out the cat sat, the hat sat. They kind of sound similar, right, <coughs> uh, in terms of the makeup of phonemes. And then the language model can come in and say, no, no, clearly you said the cat sat. The hat sat doesn't make any sense, right? So uh, you then get a transcription out of the language model. So I actually want to focus in on the acoustic model, dive a little deeper into what's happening in the acoustic model, because that's kind of where a lot of the very speech-specific magic of at least uh, most traditional state-of-the-art speech recognizers happens. So let's take a look in there. So this is, the, this is what kind of is in the internals of the acoustic model. And this is made up of several subcomponents itself. The first <laughs> such is, is feature extraction. So you guys are all probably familiar with the process of feature extraction for different domains. Uh, and in audio, what that means is really computing a Fourier transform. Uh, and 
during this computation actually trying to use uh, insights from how we as humans process sound uh, in order to extract relevant features. So one such insight is uh, actually that we hear audio, uh, at least in terms of frequencies, on a nonlinear scale in our ears. We kind of resolve the frequencies of audio on a nonlinear scale. So what I mean by that is the difference between 100 hertz and 200 hertz might sound similar to, say, the difference between 10,000 and 20,000 hertz. And th this is called the MEL scale in speech recognition, and we'll take that into account in the feature extraction stage. After feature extraction comes speaker adaptation. The job of speaker adaptation is to kind of remove the speaker-specific effects of the, the features and leave us with like a, a representation that's almost like the global or mean speaker. And then finally, after speaker adaptation comes phoneme prediction. And again, the job of phoneme prediction is to predict what phonemes are present in this snippet of sound. And this is typically done these days with a deep neural network. Uh, it doesn't have to be a deep neural network. It can be any supervised machine learning algorithm. But typically these days, it's done with a deep neural network. OK, so that's what's going on in speech recognition, at least in most of the external state-of-the-art recognizers you will find at a very high level. Uh, I want to get a little bit into deep learning now. So, uh, you know, drawing a little inspiration from computer vision. Uh, say that I have this task, right? And my task is I have a data set of images of coffee mugs. And what I'd like to do is to correctly classify uh, if there's a coffee mug present or not. A really simple task. Uh, well, the way that this worked several years ago is I, as a human, would kind of approach the problem I would sit and look at it for a little while, try to build up my intuition about what's important uh, from these data points to my ability to correctly classify them. And I would notice perhaps that edges in the image are really important, or perhaps that circular shapes are really important. And what I would then do is try to build an algorithm which was capable of extracting those relevant features. And then I would present those features to some kind of learning algorithm. And that learning algorithm would make a prediction. So again, I have <laughs> hand-designed features on top of my image, and that passes those features. Those features are passed to a learning algorithm, which can make a prediction. So the observation in computer vision uh, was that I could take these, these feature extractors, these hand-designed feature extractors, rip them out of the system, rip out the learning algorithm on, on top of that, and replace it all with a deep neural network. So this deep neural network now receives the pixels directly of the image as input. And it turns out that this works much, much better. <clears throat> so why does this work much, much better? Well, you know, honestly, nobody really knows why it works so much better. But, you know, we can try to inform our intuition a little bit. Uh, one thing that we might do is probe the network and try to ask it different questions and understand what it's learning. And if we do this, say that we ask the lower layers, we say, what excites the neurons in the lower layers of the network? Uh, and in the case of faces, if we had a data set of faces, like this one here of Barack Obama, and we ask that question, we might find that the lower layers, the, lower, the neurons in the lower layers are excited by edges. Edges of different rotations and translations, but edges nonetheless. Uh, if I ask the same question of the neurons in the middle layers, I'll probably find, well, I will actually find that they are excited by object parts, ears, eyes, noses. If I ask the same question of the higher layers, I'll find that they might be, they are excited by faces, different faces and faces at different positions. So what we get here is this really amazing notion of like hierarchical abstraction that the, the network is learning on its own. Uh, and again, at no point am I asking the network, you know, explicitly look for edges. <coughs> explicitly look for face parts in the middle layers or faces in the upper layers. I simply give it the data set and the ability to learn from that data set and it learns what's relevant towards making the correct decision. And in this case it turns out edges are. In this case, what was the task for the network? You know, uh, this might have been an unsupervised uh, yeah, I did Size yeah, so you know, ra rather than here for me take a look at this, but I think it was some kind of uh, reconstruction cost uh, on the images. Okay. 
Okay, so, uh, why deep learning? Well, what we might see if we kind of empirically observe the performance of other algorithms, other machine learning algorithms, is that as we scale up the amount of training data we have available to us, and note this is labeled training data, as in supervised training data, uh, we might see that other machine learning algorithms tend to saturate. We get very marginal returns from doubling our training set. And the great thing about deep learning, at least empirically, is that it often looks more like this. It continues to improve rapidly as we increase the amount of data. Okay, so drawing inspiration from computer vision, uh, let's take a look at the deep learning pipe, uh, the speech recognition pipeline again. And I showed you guys this slide earlier. This is what kind of the state of the art speech recognition pipeline looks like. Uh, and where deep learning has already really taken a hold is in the acoustic model. So this is a deep neural network. What we'd like to do, similar to what they did in computer vision, is just replace the entire thing with a deep neural network. We'd like to go directly from audio to an output transcription and let the network learn what's relevant to making that, those decisions. Uh, and so deep speech is, has kind of taken a big step in this direction. We haven't completely achieved this picture, but we have taken a big step in this direction. Uh, there are a few challenges in order to achieve this picture. The first is what I call the variable length problem. And this is just how do we handle time series data? Uh, as, you, as you may know, uh, not all audio snippets are the same length. Some are 10 seconds, some are 20 seconds. Uh, so we need a way to handle this problem. And I see that we might have two possible solutions. One is to try to make everything the same length. Uh, and you know, it's actually not as crazy as it sounds to do that. I mean, this actually happens in computer vision all the time, right? If I go to the web and I get you know, a data set of, say, a million images, when I first collect those images, they're not all going to be the same size. Some of them might be 100 by 200, some of them might be 400 by 600. And I'll just pick some nice power of two, like 256, and just rescale everything to be 256 by 256. And the reason this works is because, to a large extent, images are, well, the underlying class of the object or the location of the object is invariant to deformations that shrink or grow the image. Uh, in speech recognition, well, in audio, this is much less the case. So if I increase my audio snippet, you know, by it, too much, it's no, longer, it's no longer going to sound reasonable at all, even to a human. Uh, likewise, if I shorten it too much. So we have no reason to expect that this is a good approach in speech recognition. So rather, what we're going to do is try to find a model which can handle variable length inputs. Uh, and what we're going to use is a recurrent neural network. <laughs> and the way that this works is I have some waveform like this, and I'm just going to slice it up into three bins, like that, into three time steps. On top of the first time step, I'll just plop a deep neural network, which will read from the input at time step one. On top of the second time step, I will plop another deep neural network. And this network will now read from the input at time step two and the hidden state at time step one. Right? And then I'll just do the same thing on top of time step three. And you can see that this will generalize to an arbitrary number of time steps. So, how do you decide the window size? The window size. Uh, uh, Cross-validation, I would say. But, uh, but is it the same size of the, for, the, for those windows? Or? Are these windows the same size? Yes. These are all the same size as each other. Right. Is that your question? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I'll show you our model in a, in a minute, and you'll see that we don't suffer from that problem because it's what's called a bidirectional recurrent neural network. But I'll show you that in a second. Okay, so uh, other challenges that we will encounter as we're trying to scale deep learning to our problem. Well, one is just data. Where are we going to get all the data that we need to train this model successfully? Uh, and and I might have two approaches here. The first approach is to go out into the wild and try to collect more real data. Maybe there are some benchmarks, maybe uh, 
maybe I can you know hire some people to give me data or you know go work for a company that has a bunch of data. Uh, but often it's the case that real data is expensive and hard to come by. So what we're going to also try to do is look for ways of cleverly synthesizing more data out of the data that we already have. Uh, and the way that this works in vision is say I have a picture of a house. Well, I'm trying to think of ways that I can change this picture, deform this picture, while preserving the underlying label, preserving the fact that it's a house. One thing that I might do is just translate it to the side like this, shift it to the left. Uh, another thing I can do is reflect it about its vertical axis. It can also rotate it, like so. In all of these cases, it's still a house. We still expect the machine to recognize it as a house, but it actually looks very, very different, as you can imagine. The pixels at each location are very, very different. So in speech recognition, it's uh, a little bit less clear what we can do to this kind of signal to deform it and yet preserve the, the correct transcription. Uh, one thing that we might do, which we do do, is take a clean snippet of speech. You guys probably can hear this. Sorry. Uh, th that was me saying the clean brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. I could take a noisy snippet. And I can literally sum the two together, sum their elements. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And what you hear there is actually a relatively realistic sounding you know, snippet of audio, me saying the same thing, but now it's got, a, it's got some background noise in it. So it's almost like a new training example to the net. Okay, so data is one challenge. Uh, and of course, as we scale the amount of data that we want to train our model on, that will make training time take a lot longer. Uh, similarly, as we increase the amount of data, we want to make our model larger, give it more capacity to learn from this data by increasing the number of parameters or increasing the number of connections. Uh, and this will, of course, lead to longer training time. So what we'll do here is instead of using uh, CPUs, which are capable of you know, computing at, say, something like 100, floating, 100 giga floating point operations per second, multiplications and additions, floating point operations. Uh, we'll use GPUs, which are you know, one and a half orders of magnitude faster. Uh, and you know, I should say that GPUs are not a panacea in the sense that everywhere you have a CPU, you can just plop in a GPU and things will just run 10 times faster. Uh, they involve a really specific, or they shine in a really specific type of computation. And that type of computation is when I have you know, multiple instances of, of data, and I'm operating on that data with the same instructions. Uh, and it turns out that matrix multiply is a great example of this. And at the heart of most deep learning algorithms are matrix multiplications, some small number of matrix multiplications. So deep learning you know, maps extremely well onto this kind of hardware. And of course, one GPU is not enough for us. Uh, so we will just get many GPUs and we'll put them all you know, into boxes together and have them communicate over super fast networks. Okay, so that's high level deep learning. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about deep speech. Uh, so like I said, at the, at the core of deep speech are two crucial ingredients, data, computation. So really how do we solve the two problems that I mentioned earlier with scaling up deep learning? Uh, before I get into that, first let me show you the model. So this is actually not that much more complicated than the recurrent neural network you saw earlier. It looks a little bit, you know, looks like there's a little more going on here, but there's, there's actually not that much more. So really all we have is a forward recurrent layer here, and then we have a backward recurrent layer here. Uh, and the intuition there is that I'd like to use information both from the past and the future to inform the present. Uh, at the lowest layer, we have a spectrogram. Uh, so the, 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 audio, the audio wave file you saw earlier, we compute a spectrogram on top of that, as in we kind of compute a sliding, uh, a windowed sliding Fourier transform. Uh, and that's all we do to the audio. We do nothing else before we feed it to the network. Uh, and you can find spectrogram as, you know, it's a mature technology, you can find it in Num or in Matplotlib and Python or in MATLAB, for example. Uh, 
we, you know, we really use those, those functions, right? Uh, and then we feed that spectrogram through the network, and at the top, we predict a character of the alphabet. So deep speech is what's called uh, a grapheme-based system. And grapheme uh, is, a grapheme is actually the smallest unit of written language. So in English, this is, of course, the alphabet. And at each time step, we're just going to predict one letter <coughs> of the alphabet, including the space character and some punctuation. Uh, so, you know, you saw in the previous picture actually that we kind of put the, the neural network at different time steps across the input. And it turns out that often it's the case that our, uh, the number of time steps that we segment this into is much, much, or many, many more than the number of characters we'd like to produce. So, you know, I might have 100 time steps in my input and I only want to say the cat. That's six letters in it, in it, plus two spaces, right? Uh, so how are we going to get around this? Well, we're just going to allow the network to output essentially a no-op or <coughs> blank character. So if it thinks nothing happened at this time step or it shouldn't output anything, it will output one of these underscores, which is a blank character. And then in order to get from this, which might be an example of something the network would output directly, blank, blank, th, blank, 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 etc. We will just simply yank out all the blanks, all the underscores, and collapse repeat characters that are not separated by blanks. And this will yield the cat. And we can do the same thing you know, for this, this potential output. It also produces the cat. So it allows the network to decide when to output the relevant characters. <coughs> That is correct. Um, there's a lot of variability in the way it can appear to anyone. Uh, how do you yes. Do that to yes. Uh, we, uh, we use a dynamic programming algorithm <coughs> to integrate over all possible lines. Uh, and this, is a, this, is, this was a, a known algorithm. It's called CTC, Connectionist Temporal Classification. Uh, and you, know, you can compute it actually pretty quickly. So at, at, at training time, what we do is we essentially say, I'd like the network to maximize the probability of the correct transcription, uh, which might be any one of these possible alignments that would come out of that. So, so sorry, do you mean uh, how much overlap are there between these? <laughs> What's the overlap between consecutive time steps? I see. Uh, it's something like in our system, 100 milliseconds. So at each time step, this is not drawn to scale. At each time step, I will process something like uh, 10 new milliseconds of information and overlap with, overlap with the previous time step, something like 100 milliseconds. That's a good point. And we actually do kind of stride this uh, in, yeah. We do, we do actually skip, uh, we do actually skip. Uh, uh, but we haven't really explored like how, much, how many more clever things you could do with, with such things like that. Yes? So I have a question about your graphene based approach. So it was fun for like a cat, but if it was a word, that has to have a lot. Repeating letters, which are next to each other, like speech, as P D E C H. You said you have to have the all the similar, all the same uh, uh, letters and that merge into one. But how can you deal with the repeating letters? Uh, so the way that I would deal with repeating letters is I would force the network to output a blank in between two letters that okay. are the same. So if I wanted to have two A's here, if this was a blank, that would result in two A's, right? Uh, I only collapse when there are no blanks in between. <coughs> yes? Uh, is the uh, graphene still related to coding? 
uh, is the graphene related to a phoneme? Uh, it depends what language. Uh, in English, uh, the relationship between letters and the underlying sounds can often be uh, not uh, ambiguous or not evident. Uh, in other languages, they're much more phonetic. Uh, so the, the, the letters often map very nicely to the sounds. Yes? What is the dimension of the spectrogram, or how many parameters are you using? In the spectrogram? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's determined by the sample rate of the audio. And the sample rate of the audio that we've been using is about 16,000 kilohertz. Okay. And vertically, uh, so that, that in the spectrogram we're using, that results in uh, 160, uh, because we're stepping by 10 milliseconds. So that results in 160 frequency bins in an energy tank. Yes. So then what about the case of like gas versus gas, right? They all sound, one has two S's and one has one S. Right. So sort of follow up what he was saying, do you yeah. need some pre-processing for the data to make that sort of separation? No, we do nothing to pre-process the data. Actually, uh, it'd be interesting to see how the network currently handles that situation. But it is certainly the case that it's learning something non-trivial about language. Uh, and so we would hope that, uh, since it's seen examples of bass and gas, or you know, bass and yeah, uh, bass and gas, that it would know when to put two S's and why not. OK, so uh, again, I mentioned data is important, having a lot of data. So uh, you know, this on the y-axis here is the number of thousands of hours of speech, so 1,000 hours. 2000, et cetera. And uh, we, when we were kind of going to collect data to train our model, we first turned to a lot of available benchmarks. Uh, these are published, these three actually are published by the Linguistic Data Consortium. Uh, Wall Street Journal is basically read clips of Wall Street Journal, uh, Switchboard and Fisher are telephone speech. And that gave us about 2,300 hours of speech, which is not enough for our system. So we then went and got about 5,000 more hours of our own training set. Uh, and added this to the Wall Street Journal switchboard and Fisher. <coughs> that gave us about 7,000 hours. Uh, and that's starting to sound pretty good. I mean, most state-of-the-art speech recognizers are trained on something like 5,000 to 10,000 hours. Uh, but for us, 7,000 hours still is, you know, deep speech has an, an appetite for data, and 7,000 hours is still not enough. So what we're going to do is actually imply some of the synthetic techniques I mentioned earlier to augment our data set. And using, uh, using our initial 7,000 hours as a core data set and adding noise to it in different ways, we're able to augment it to something like 100,000 hours of synthetic data and train the network on that. Uh, the other problem we had to over overcome when training on something like 100,000 hours of data with this, this model is how do we compute this thing efficiently? Uh, the naive implementation, even on a GPU, might take something like you know weeks to months, right, to train the model from start to finish. Uh, and so it's really important that we consider scale here uh, and optimize this. Uh, you know, it turns out that the the simple feedforward layers are actually easily parallelizable because you know they're kind of all independent, and so that's actually quite efficient and can scale nicely. Uh, the problem and lies when we're trying to compute the recurrent layers. Here are the blue arrows and the red arrows. And you can see that because these arrows induce a sequential dependence. So we cannot compute node at time step t until we've computed node at time step t minus 1. Right? So the forward recurrent layer is slow to compute and must be sequential. And the backward recurrent layer likewise. So the first thing you <laughs> might observe is that these two Layer, these two recurrent uh, portions of this layer are totally independent. So we could have one GPU compute the forward part and another process compute the backward part. Now, the problem with this, and it's not actually super easy to see from this picture, but the problem is that if we did it this way, what would happen is these two processes, GPU1 and GPU2, would actually have to exchange a lot of information uh, when we go to compute the next layer. And so the communication cost is going to hurt us. It's not going to allow this, this, this trick to scale well. 
Uh, and so rather, what we did was literally cut the model down the middle, slice it down the middle, mm -hmm. and have one GPU work on the left half, one GPU work on the right half. And the way that this works is I'm just going to have GPU 1 do the first part of the forward recurrent layer until it gets to the middle. GPU 2 will do the first part of the backward recurrent layer until it gets to the middle. When they reach the middle, they'll exchange a tiny little bit of information, they'll pass a small message, and then they'll swap. And GPU 1 will do the second part of the backward recurrent layer to the end, and GPU 2 will do the second part of the forward recurrent layer. <coughs> yes? How will you stack this way on top of each other? Right. You have to cut somewhere, and also when we recognize the speech, we usually use a couple of words to figure out if I didn't hear it right from the context. But I don't go to the middle step. Right. Uh, so usually when we're you know, running sound through this model, we uh, run it in small segments, something like 10 to 20 seconds of audio. Yeah. And that's kind of because that's how people use speech in practice. If we wanted to uh, transcribe something like, you know, a lecture that's 30 minutes, uh, we would have to think about how to chop that up cleverly in order to not have to unroll this thing for thousands of time steps. What is the dimension? Uh, do you mean how many parameters are there in it? Okay, so let me see if I can answer your question. Let me know if I don't. Uh, these, these nodes here uh, each represent a hidden unit, and that hidden unit uh, is one number, and there will be something like 2,000 of these uh, in our network. And then each of those nodes will communicate to the next layer of 2,000, say. Uh, it's on the order of something like 2,000 in each layer. <coughs> Did I answer your question? Kind of. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, with the network sizes we're using, it's, it, it gives something like 40, 30 to 40 million parameters. And if you were to unroll this network and count the number of connections, as in kind of the number of synapses between hidden units, you would find that it's something like 5 billion. So there's a lot of connections, many, many more connections than there are, than there are parameters. It's trained with back propagation. Yes. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, it's a fully connected network, or these are like partial connections? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's essentially fully connected. I mean, the, the input you can think of as being partially connected in the sense that we're kind of striding across this, almost like a 1D convolution. Uh, but then if you kind of look at just one slice of it, you can treat that as a fully connected. Yes. So is it able to be transcribed in real time? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I better not cite numbers on that yet because, well, I don't know precisely. Um, but uh, let me tell you what it should be able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and most speech recognition systems should be able to transcribe in something like a half real time in order for latency to be uh, uh, acceptable to the, the users. Um, so that's kind of the goal. And it's, it's not hard for me to see us able to do that with this. Actually, the bigger problem with, uh, with doing real-time transcription with this is, is that the backwards recurrent layer makes it hard to do what's called online transcription, where uh, I want to transcribe as I'm receiving input. Uh, so that's a, that's a problem to be solved. Yes? In quantum field theory, through solid state physics, they have problems with similar topology. And they've got a very robust method of Solving that. Uh, translated over, you first calculate the field of the, the wave function of the electrons, then from that you calculate the electric field that they generate, and then based on that you come back to the electrons. It's an iteration between the two fields. Trans and so you're essentially introducing another time dimension. So you <coughs> In this case, what that would say is gee, you take those stacks of disks and you make a taller stack in a direction perpendicular to the plane there, and you then couple from one layer in that stack to the next deeper layer. It works wonderfully well in all sorts of field problems, 
which are topologically similar to it. I see. Yes. Uh, you're going to have to draw that for me uh, later. Sure. That sounds very interesting. Uh, is there another question? Yes. How do you do a five directional uh, network? It's better than uh, one directional linear. Um, but can you um, have any experiment on uh, single directional network to see how much degradation you're going to get? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't done it at a large scale yet. Uh, but I have done the, those kinds of experiments on smaller data sets. And, you know, as you would expect, introducing the first recurrent layer, even the forward directional recurrent layer, is responsible for a lot of the improvement. Uh, the backward recurrent layer gets you a little bit more, but it's, it's, it's not trivial, right? It's, it's uh, something like, uh, I better not quote numbers, but it's, uh, it's not trivial. You, you showed us you need a lot of GPUs to train the network. Once it's trained, what's the minimum system it requires to run? What's the minimum computing system to, you know, uh, to generate the prediction once it's trained? <coughs> I mean, the minimum yeah, system in a sense, like it could run on one CPU core. Yeah, can it? It can. Yes. Okay. Can it run on a mobile phone? Uh, well, if you have a beefy mobile phone, uh, <laughs> it, it probably is the case that memory uh, it could fit in a mobile phone, but maybe I'm not sure. Yeah, right. Uh, I think that the answer is probably no. It cannot. No on a mobile phone. Yes on a laptop. Yes on. Yes. Yes. Well, I think you're on the Can you write everything from scratch, or do you use existing libraries? Ah. Okay, let me actually, um, let me answer it. Let me actually, if you guys don't have any more specific questions about this particular slide, I'd like to address these questions later with a couple of my colleagues because they have more interesting things to say about that. Yes? Um, so, you, so you trained on a whole other standard thing. Is there any thought of using the network itself to find trace of boundaries or word boundaries so that you can re reduce the forward backward region to smaller segments of speech? Uh, yeah, so that would be a good idea if the, if the examples were quite long. Is that what you mean, to try to find where the word boundaries are and segment them? Anything over, you know, anything over five words might have phrasal boundaries or might even have multiple right. right, yeah. So I, I imagine there is a lot, of clever, a lot of clever ideas you could do with that. We haven't tried that, any of that yet. Yeah. Yes? So are you using the colors Sorry, I, I didn't touch that. Are you using a hidden map model? Uh, no, uh, okay. we are not at all. Yeah. Uh, so, for those of you familiar with traditional speech recognition, at the core of traditional speech recognition is what's called a hidden markup model. Uh, it's a statistical method for understanding time series, and uh, we have kind of ripped that totally out of the picture. Uh, in this system. <coughs> yes. Did you try to use to combine a spectrogram with MFCC, for example, uh, maybe for helping convergence between? Or maybe it's not useful? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think, we, so we haven't tried MFCCs in, in the large scale, this model yet, or, on top of spectrograms. Yeah. Uh, we have, I mean, we haven't tried them on their own or on top of spectrograms. I, I imagine that uh, if you have a large enough data set and uh, in this, this model, you probably would find mm -hmm. that it's not very helpful. Uh, but that said, in, you know, in traditional speech recognition, it's extremely helpful to use MFCCs. So. Yes. Um, so there is speaking to each of you vertically. Yes. Um, and you may then communicate the uh, uh, Yep. Does it work if this communication is in the randomly you just replace the input by the uh, I don't know, but uh, that would be a fun thing to try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will work, perhaps not as well. Uh, okay, let me move on. So, uh, what do the results look like? Well, we collected our own data set, our own test set of about 200 utterances. 100 of these were clean, as in there was no background noise. 100 of them we added noise to. Uh, and we benchmarked this data set against, you know, some of the world's best speech recognition systems, including, you can see here, Apple Dictation, Bing, Google, Wit.ai, which is a startup that has pretty good speech recognition technology. They're now in my district. Uh, and what you see here is that deep speech, the blue bar, the light blue bar, you know, only does a little bit better in the clean data setting uh, than all the rest. But 
if you look at the noisy examples, you'll notice that we've made a big improvement. Uh, and so combined, of course, we'll do better because we've made such a, a large impact on the noisy samples. Uh, let me just say one more thing, though, and, and that is that you know, there's still a big difference here between the noisy speech and the clean speech. So there's a long ways to go. And uh, if you were to look at how humans did in transcribing either of these, I suspect that we're still a long ways off. So there's a lot of progress to make. Yes? What are the y axis? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, good question. Uh, this is word error rate. So word error rate is the edit distance between two strings of words. OK, so that's all I have for deep speech. For those of you interested in learning more, uh, you know, Stanford has a great deep learning tutorial that we wrote a little while back. Uh, and I highly encourage you to check it out if you would like a hands-on introduction to deep learning. Uh, if you would like to know more of the technical details of the deep speech system, that's a link to our archive publication. Ah, yeah. Uh, bit.ly slash deep speech. Yes? They're, they're the Stanford course? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, have all the notes. Sure, yeah. So, great recommendation. Uh, Stanford just had a course last winter, or this winter, actually. It was this winter. Still going on. So, uh, taught by you know, uh, a PhD student at Stanford, Andre Karpathy and Faith Italy. Uh, and that's that. So, that is a class on convolutional neural networks and computer vision, very specific to that domain, but probably a great source of interesting material. Uh, Okay, so information about Baidu research. Uh, you know, you can follow our latest technology progress. These three sources, I encourage you to do so: Twitter, Facebook, and check out our tech blog for updates about kind of the things we're doing in speech recognition, the things we're doing in computer vision, and other technologies in AI. Uh, and for those of you that are kind of excited by the vision of making impact in AI and uh, impact that you know has potential to affect a lot of people. Uh, I would encourage you to check out our job website or you know, just come talk to any of the Baidu researchers here today. Okay, that's all I got. So, so you know, I actually took a little bit longer than I expected. So actually, let me just see, if you have questions about the system that you think are interesting to the rest of the group, could you raise your hand? Yes, I didn't answer your question. I'll, I'll answer your question. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, great. So there's still a lot of questions. Do you guys mind sitting for a, a little bit longer and, and listening to some questions? Okay, cool. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually invite uh, a couple. Uh, is, oh, you're here. Carl. Yeah. So Carl is here. Oh, Eric had to take off. Okay. okay. Yes, great. Uh, okay, cool. So, so Carl. I'm Carl. I'm just here to back stop that Yes. Great. Um, so Carl will answer questions with me, hopefully change the voice that you've been listening to at the very least. Uh, Do you want water? Do you want water? Yeah, have water. Do I sound really raspy? <laughs> uh, okay, so go ahead and start asking questions if you have any. We can stop when you don't. Yeah, go ahead. How many layers are there in your Uh How many layers? Uh, five layers. Five layers. Yeah. Did you experiment with 20 layer networks? So yeah, so it's uh, five layers each with about 2,500 units. Uh, so if you do it out, it's about 44 million parameters total. Uh, I think we did some experiments with sort of going in the direction of the trade-off is obvious. As you have fewer layers, it's a less expressive model, and so you probably aren't going to be able to capture the richness of variation. Uh, as you add more layers, uh, it takes longer to train, and you might overfit to train the data. So I think even still train the model to convergence like on all of the data you say it takes like four or five days. Yeah. It's a bit like that. So like adding another couple of layers uh, might be a great idea, but you start getting into some of these to train. Uh, which even if it were better, uh, the more important thing actually is how quickly you can evaluate new ideas. And so if it takes two weeks to evaluate your idea, it's like it's not good. But things are getting faster, so Good. So the 
currents here, so you have aren't those also fully connected? So how many waves are going through? Uh, yes, they are fully connected. Okay. Yeah. Densely connected. Yeah. Something like uh, four million parameters in yeah, um, how much of the improvement, if you had to guess, is because of the algorithm you made? And how much is because of this nice data set that you bootstrapped for yourself? Um, I, I think both. Uh, <laughs> I know that's like not a real answer. Um, but so what's exciting about deep learning, I think, at a higher level, I mean, these are not new techniques, right? This is not something that was invented in the last few years. These ideas have been around for a while. Uh, is now that we're able to build models at this scale, it seems to be the one approach that's able to really absorb and make use of thousands of hours of data. So if you had thousands of hours of data and a traditional speech model, it probably would do only marginally better than if you had 500 hours of data. Uh, if you took this model and it had only 500 hours of data, you would do really, really, you should totally memorize the training set and not generalize very well. So I think it's more a reading of the model in the data. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that collecting data seems to be a problem, but YouTube is would have millions and mega millions of hours of data. Why yeah. is that not a good source? Because you get all kinds of noisy data versus clean data. Yeah. Uh, more broadly, the, there is a lot of captioned audio on the internet, uh, including YouTube. Uh, and there are many reasons why that might be hard to use. Uh, legal reasons are one. Uh, how to filter that data such that we you know that the data we're getting has uh, a reasonable rate of noise or a reason, reasonable label error rate is another problem you might encounter. Uh, another problem you might encounter is that often captioned data on the on the web, captioned audio is really long. So like an NPR segment of 20 minutes of someone talking, which will be transcribed. And in order to train my network on that, I will have to segment that. And so it's, 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 there's a lot of challenges like this that you find. Uh, but no, it's a great <laughs> idea, I would say. I think there are some interesting research questions there too. For example, I mean, the captions on YouTube, I imagine, are not great. Uh, they're not going to be perfectly aligned. They're going to be misspelling. Mm -hmm. They're going to be mistakes. Uh, our training data is very variable noise. Uh, I'd imagine there is a rate of noise in the training data at which point it starts being a net negative rather than a net positive. And so where that is, is sort of a different question. All the way back. Uh, yeah, so scale of data sets and the speed of computing. It's something that takes five days in 2015, would have taken 10 days in 2013, would have taken 20 days in 2011. It's not even that long ago. Uh, there are, I think, a couple algorithmic improvements. Um, I think people have gotten better, much better at initialization, um, being particularly smart about how you initialize your weights so that the gradient you get early on during back propagation looks like make good progress early on. Uh, it's quite hard to sort of, once you get going, uh, it's pretty easy to train around it, but it's kind of hard to latch on to the error surface and get going. Um, and so I think initialization and like improvements and optimization, uh, doing basic gradient descent almost works. And then there are a couple of tricks around. If anyone is familiar with Nesterov's accelerated gradient, that's what we to train this, um, we'll go look it up. It's basically just normal gradient descent. We have a couple tricks that actually seem to help a lot. So I'd say it's tricks around the edge and lots of data and lots of. Uh, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, would it be possible to even think of replicating these results on Amazon boxes with GPUs, just even the same algorithms and the same data set, or you really need that infrastructure you guys have? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it would be possible, just slower. Uh, how slower? You know, I mean, like, like a lot of the reason that we like our networks to train quickly is because we don't know what's going to work yeah, a priori. Uh, so we want to be able to test out a lot of them in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, recreating something, you know, is always a much easier process than, than coming up with it in the first place. Uh, so I think like it might be slow, but like stomachly, stomachly slow, like maybe weeks if you had a good implementation. The only sort of fancy hardware thing that you don't get on Amazon is extremely high bandwidth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think they still they have like a tiny bit of internet on the GPU boxes. And we do run, I mean, you can run the network having been trained easily on AWS. Like we have a demo that we use control uh, that just runs on AWS. Once it's trained. Once it's trained, right. No, I, the, the reason I was asking is that, I mean, the, the tutorials on deep learning are, are cool and fine, but if you need that hardware to make, make something useful, <coughs> there is a barrier to entry that yeah. is pretty significant. Yeah. We need to disagree. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, I never answered your question. Do you still have your question? Yeah, and what more. <laughs> yes, go ahead. So one question is, um, in the case of visual recognition, you illustrated what each layer of the network is learning. Yeah. Have you tried to do this with sounds, and what do they sound like? Yeah. And the second question is whether, whether you know, you use the off-the-shelf uh, neural network library, or you uh, right, everything right. from scratch. Yeah, right. okay. So first question, uh, do we try to kind of probe the network to see what it's learning for audio, like right. they do in vision? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, we do sometimes, and it's often much less informative. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, actually recently one of one of our colleagues was trying to do exactly that and found that it was really hard to deduce what the lower layer features were actually doing. Uh, but you could kind of troll the literature and find some examples of where people have successfully learned filters which resemble phones uh, in audio. They have successfully uh, learned lower layer filters, uh, lower layer, they have found that the units in the lower layers respond to phone use. And if you try to picture uh, what the weights of those units look like, you would find that they look like phone use. And then your second question was, do we use off-the-shelf uh, libraries? And uh, the answer is no, not for our deep neural network training. Uh, and the reason is because uh, <laughs> it's important for us to distribute our calculation across a lot of GPUs, not just in a single box. And most of the off-the-shelf libraries you would find are really good at the single box case, uh, but have not tackled the across network case. Uh, actually, two more questions, and then, uh, and then we're going to wrap up and mingle some. Yes, so yeah, good. Uh, have you tested with accented speakers? Like, uh, you said initially that speech recognition doesn't work very well with um, different accents. So was this tested on different accents, or did you do anything in your like synthesized data to do some normalizations for accents? Yeah, I mean, so we've tested on different accents. Um, it's still, uh, I think it's just as you saw the results with noise, the results are similar. Where I think we do relatively better than other people in the gap between an accent and accented speech, mm -hmm. uh, but there is still a gap, and that we want to close that. Um, I don't think we do anything explicitly to normalize or so synthesize like accent variations, mm -hmm. but something we've actually started exploring recently are, so for the work here and the work described in the paper, all of the sort of synthetic additions to the data was sort of this additive nuance. We can just take two waveforms and stick them on top of each other. Uh, we have started to explore sort of transformation, linear nonlinear transformations <coughs> to the data that we do things like change accents, change pitch, things like that. Have you seen yeah. those frequency walking, like vocal track normalization, which helps sort of uh, mm -hmm. augment the data and maybe improve this uh, accent experience? Yeah, uh, vocal track length would be more for well, normalizing across different vocal track lengths. Yeah. It's probably not going to help much with the accents, uh, not as much. Uh, and a lot of these things, there are a lot of clever things you can do with speaker adaptation to try to remove the effects of how different speakers sound. Uh, the one problem you'll encounter when trying to do this in a production system, and this is why we don't actually explore this research direction too intently, 
is that it's really hard to kind of instantiate on a single speaker in your system uh, and uh, know the identity of that speaker. Uh, so you might be able to do some clever things on mobile phones, but uh, you'll have to be able to estimate a lot about the speaker from a small amount of data. Uh, one more question. Yeah, who, who have I not heard from? I don't think we've heard from you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I have several of them, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite question? <laughs> I have a question about uh, do you use data parallelization? So you showed that you split the model between GPUs. So do you split also data, like data to shards, and train uh, for the train your parts of the models, on, like different replicas of the model using different GPUs? And if yes, then uh, how do you merge the updates together? Uh, so short answer yes. Uh, long answer is, so say you have, uh, so we're doing mini batch based training, I don't know if you were explaining mini batches earlier. No. Let's talk about mini batches briefly. So, uh, because GPUs are much more efficient if you're multiplying big matrices than small matrices, uh, for every training iteration, rather than just looking at a single example, so sort of a single input output pair, you'll look at a whole list of examples. Uh, so many hundreds of examples together that you process in parallel, so you're going matrices rather than vectors and things are faster. Uh, so when we want to distribute things even more, we will take, sort of, imagine we were going to two-way data parallel. You would have two instantiations of the model. We would make our mini batch twice as large. Each guy gets half of the examples. Uh, and then uh, we're going to do forward propagation, backward propagation, compute the gradients. Uh, and then they just share the gradients. Yeah, the so interesting thing starts when you do not, uh, like, to split data not to two parts, but to many of them, like right. 10. So I think our, so we have- make exchange all of them. Right, so we've been in the regime where having everyone synchronize their gradients totally at uh, each iteration uh, is fast. <coughs> uh, it adds almost, you know, you get almost perfect scale. Uh, that if I go to a data kernel, I get almost twice as fast. If I go to a data kernel, I get three and a half times as fast. Because there is some cost, but the cost is small relative to the parallelization gain. Uh, I think that's because we sort of were focused on this regime of rather than uh, sort of focusing on very high intensity high performance computing. So big GPU, a small number of very powerful GPUs rather than a large number of general purpose CPUs. That having been said, uh, we are thinking about what happens as you go more and more and more. Uh, and the answer is probably something like you do approximations. So rather than synchronizing with everyone, you synchronize with a random subset of your neighbors at every iteration, and you change that random subset every time, and hopefully things work out. Uh, yeah. So uh, I certainly have no results to show, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are already no guarantees about anything. So uh, doing even more approximations doesn't uh, worsen your guarantees, certainly. Great. Okay. So that was the last question. Uh, I want to give this book to actually. My friend here, whose question I ignored for <laughs> 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll hand, I'll hand this off to you.